if you're making a single portable then um, one system only requires certain sets of contacts. If you're making a multiple system then you have to include all of them whether the system requires it or not because some of them do need them. So we have the facility here for RGB um, and either the C-Sync or for systems that don't need that we have regular composite mode. Stereo audio um, and because on the multi-system, the Unity system, I'm using one SCART for all of the AV. Um, this is a switch that effectively selects which mode it's in. Um, if it's ground, it goes through composite. If there's a small voltage, it goes through RGB. Video ground has to be separated from the main system ground because in the vast majority of, of uh, consoles, they are the same. However, if you take the video ground from, for example, the PlayStation 2, then you get very bad um, video quality. So they have to be, in effect, separated. Um, I've also got a switch here for the LED, so that when it's selecting a bank, as in all these switches, these 18 contacts for one system, it will then say that those are activated. A controller, again, well, okay, you know, 64 only has uh, two plus ground, but there's quite a lot of systems that have eight wires inside the controller cable plus the ground. So this is why, for the multi-system, each of the console systems needs to have 18 contacts. Which leads us on to a problem, because, of course, there aren't switches that are made like that. If we look at a normal switch, then, I mean, okay, this is just a single pole, single throw, but if I put a whole stack of these together, then it would be very hard to get them all to synchronize at the same time, which therefore means that this pre made option is not an option. Came in with these, which are eight, um, eight pole, two throw, but of course that would require two of these together for those 18 contacts. Um, this actually obviously doesn't do the full 18, I had to do the uh, the ground separated, but ended up with a bank of switches like this, which because I was having to press two of these at the same time, they were connected at the back, then it required a little bit of a push to make them activated, and also, as you saw there, it didn't work all the time to push in and push out. So this worked, but wasn't ideal. <laughs> I looked for a commercial solution, couldn't find one, so then basically was back into making one myself. So the basic principle of needing um, this amount of contacts per system, the way it resolved it was if you're using a piece of wood and then you put your bare wire across like this, obviously nine times down, and then bend the plastic part of the wire down the back and super glue it in place, you then have these wires um, showing. Now <clears throat> obviously to exaggerate it a little bit, if this is your piece of wood and you bend your wires across and you super glue them down, you're going to end up with wires like this. So I simply pressed this down onto a unit to get this part flat. Now, again to exaggerate very slightly, it's going to mean that some wires are slightly thicker than others, even though they're using the same type. Some may be slightly more raised than others, so you'll end up with a slight gap, potentially, between one end and this end, which means that some of the pins won't make contact. So therefore, you need to come in with a way around to have the contact part here with the wire with something that's going to press down on it and then something that applies downward pressure in order to make this connect. I tried a variety of options before I came in with a solution that worked. One of which was to use the slight spring that you have with metal itself. But this didn't prove to be overly reliable so that idea was out. I then came on the idea of springs. And this is actually from a borrow pen, 
and there's plenty of spring in there that would do the job nicely. However, in case this was a bit of a prototype and a bit big and ugly, but it did work. Just to illustrate. However, the problem is that sliding this unit across those wires uh, would strip them. It would cause a lot of damage. So therefore this was a complete no-go. This was the previous solution I came up with, which I improved on, which used some nuts. In fact, since then I made these rounded so that they could move between side to side easily. Um, but again, they would press and they would allow for any imperfections in the wire itself so that these remain contact. Again, the actual connectors had a couple of modifications. I started off with this design, but it was going to be quite difficult to be able to run the um, connections through here, so that's why I ended up with a nice simple approach of having the bare wires connecting through, like this. I made these 4mm apart because there will be discrepancies like this, some will be slightly thicker, some will be slightly thinner. You need to have the facility so that the nut would never be big enough in order to go to the next set, even um, if these were slightly off. And also to separate them enough so that you don't end up with them bridging across to the next one. The way that the height of this nut has been placed, again, if we take a side view, where we have the two banks of the nine contacts, the nut comes into this sort of size, roughly speaking, and without the spring, it's trying to come down about this far. So as this is pulled backwards and forwards, it will raise, applying a little bit of downwards pressure and therefore making the contact. And that in essence is what this is all about. This is a downwards view of uh, that section which has been made up, showing all of the wires which have obviously all been tinned, um, nine per post, and as you see there's an awful lot of wiring involved. I've also for simplicity labelled each of the console systems that this is going to be connected to. I've got 16 different consoles, um, each with their own pair of uh, wooden rods, which each of course have nine sets of contacts. So the idea is that as per on this side, I can wire them up to the console so that then it all works. This is the slider unit, which uh, We'll just move across, I used to do this one handed, and then select between each of the systems as you want to play at the time. This of course is the front view of the, um, the bank of switches and the slider that was made. <coughs> you notice for the compression I actually used elastic bands um, because it does, it does provide good tension and also of course they are replaceable if required although they do last for many years. And actually, instead of the foam on the back of these nuts where they make contact against the wood, I also use rubber band as well, um, because there's a tiny bit of compression there, there's enough for the job, and they're a lot more reliable than things like foam, for example. And here you can clearly see they're making contact with this set of pins. The rubber bands are also pulling together this runner, um, because I can't have anything behind here, because it would interfere with all the wires, I've made a tongue groove in effect um, so that this piece of wood carries along there and then these bands pull the whole unit together so that gets rid of any little imperfections pushes it up against the unit and bottom line is it pushes the nuts up against these contacts here but um, you can see now I put the wooden block in place um, the slider does work very easily actually in this mode as you can see it moves backwards and forwards rather nicely um, I've only set two systems at the moment in place, the Saturn and the Dreamcast, so if I put this over to the Saturn, then you can see all that working nicely. Flip the main power on.
<laughs> actually organising this into system um, into system type. So, for example, SMS Mega Drive, Saturn Dreamcast over here. You can see there's an LED showing that the system has been selected. Um, I'm probably going to change that there to a slightly brighter one. I'll just start this game so that um, you can see that it's working fine, complete with controls and everything else. Just quickly get into the game. Quite a good little game this uh, exhumed. It's like a much better version of the old style of Doom. But anyway, as you see, all the controls work quite nicely, as you would uh, expect them to do. Um, and so we just um, exit this game now, turn the system off. We can now select over to in this case the Dreamcast, like so. Turn that system on. Oh, better change the cartridge in the master controller to take the Dreamcast. Otherwise it's liable to get a bit confused. Okay, there she goes. Now turn on. As you see, this disc is now spinning instead of that one, and there you have your Dreamcast. Battery is running at slightly low in the motherboard, so it tends to ask for date configurations at the moment. And there you go. But it doesn't matter. Obviously, uh, that's really just to show that it all is all working currently. So two systems in place at the moment. The other board's fitted. They've not been connected up. And this big hole we've got in here is to allow me to put in a set of other cartridges that will fit nicely into the base over on this side. And of course there'll be a GameCube on top to fill up most of this to this space. Anyway, that's how the progress uh, of the project is coming on at the moment. Thank you for watching.